Welcome to this episode of Microchurch Next brought to you by Leadership Network. My name is Brian Johnson. I am one of the directors with the Kansas City Underground. It's a network of missionary leaders and microchurches in Kansas City. I'm also one of the directors of Microchurch Next with Leadership Network. And if you're not familiar with Leadership Network or you're just jumping in with us, know that we exist to convene catalytic conversations that foster spirit-led movements of innovation. And at our core, we want to be a prophetic uh, voice for the church, helping church leaders sense what is the spirit of God doing next across the body of Christ. And we, we don't want to just leave it in the thought realm. We really want to get our hands around, like, what are practical ways that we can join the spirit as he moves? And we want to help leaders perceive and pursue that. And so one of the themes that we're exploring this year is the emergence of microchurch movements in the West. And so this space on Tuesdays at 1230 Eastern Standard Time, we're, we're going to be having these conversations all through this year. And even though it's a virtual space, we want this just to be like a little fire that we come together, sit around and learn from leaders who are innovating in this arena of microchurch. We want to come together and seek Jesus's presence, and we want this to be a space where leaders can be reminded, hey, you're not alone. There are so many that are pursuing what the Spirit of God is doing. And so this theme that we're exploring is the return of the microchurch. This is our first theme in Microchurch Next. And of course, we don't, we don't think the microchurch ever disappeared. <laughs> we would say it's actually this very ancient form of the church. And a compelling case could be made. It's the original form of the church on the pages of the New Testament. And it's also the form of the church in significant disciple-making movements that are happening, happening globally, especially in the global south. And we've seen this resurgence of exploration in this in the West. And so today we get the privilege to talk with John Ferguson of Community Christian Church in Chicago and explore the next phase in this conversation that we're having, which is how do we live like missionaries? We think that to see microchurches emerge, we need to live like missionaries in order to make disciples, and we'll see the church emerge out of that. So, John, thank you for being with us today, and I just want to turn it over to you for a little bit, just an introduction of who you are and your role with Community Christian. Absolutely, Brian. Boy, it's great to be with you. I'm super excited about um, this uh, chance to talk and, and catch up a little bit. Um, huge believer in, in, in you and what's happening at the Kansas City Underground and, of course, Leadership Network has uh, just had tremendous influence uh, on us as a church, for sure, a new thing as a church planning movement and me personally. And, uh, you know, I was super excited when I heard that Carrie Williams was going to be the new CEO of Leadership Network and that so much of what, what good work was being done in the past is going to be continued. The cohorts, I mean, have been really been formative for us in so many ways. So I can't, I can't say enough of good things about Leadership Network and, and sort of the foundation that Bob Buford laid for that so many years ago. And uh, just the fact that his legacy is going to continue is, is so awesome. So yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for, thanks for the chance. So, and that was not a, a commercial you asked for, just to put it out there. <laughs> <We'll> take it. <laughs> I just can't help it. Uh, so you were asking me a little bit of background. Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. Just a little introduction on who you are, your role with Community Christian. Sure, man. Yeah. Um, well, I'm one of the founding pastors here at Community and we started community with just a handful of friends um, quite a quite a few years ago now, and um, you know, and, and uh, so I, I'm founding pastor, teaching pastor at community. I live in the city. My wife and I we moved into the city. Most of communities in the suburbs, but uh, we moved here about 11 years ago. So we're on the north side of Chicago. And uh, if you're familiar with the city of Chicago, if you were to drop a pin right between, say, like the John Hancock Building and Wrigley Field. Uh, that's where I live. So it's a great, great neighborhood, great place to be. But we really just moved here because uh, we just saw the need and opportunity in the city to be, you know, tremendous and uh, wanted to be about, you know, helping to start new churches in the city, come alongside the good work that God was already doing through church, churches and nonprofits in the city. And so we've been here now 11 years, lived here longer than we lived anywhere else as a married couple. So time flies. Uh, I have two kids. My son is 25. My daughter's 22. And um uh, my son's uh, working for a fintech startup in New York. My daughter lives there too, finishing up school. They actually share an apartment on the Lower East Side, which is kind of fun. And they were actually here this weekend uh, visiting in town. So um, it, it's, it's been fun to, to catch up with them. So yeah, community, new thing. I think I, I, think I covered it. Is that, is that pretty much what yeah, we're yeah, doing? Yeah, that covered okay. it. I can tell you're glowing a little bit after spending some time with your kids this weekend. So. Yeah, man. It, yeah, it's fun. They're at a great stage of life, uh, you know, when they kind of, spread their own wings on their own a little bit. And maybe I'm glowing because my daughter graduates in May. And so 
uh, we're, we're not going to be funding her to the degree that we are right now. So <laughs> after, yeah. after how many, six, six years of, of uh, uh, you know, college costs, maybe that's the glow well, that you're seeing. <laughs> and I, I've got five little ones and I, like, I, I can't even dream that far out yet. I'm just like, stay little. <laughs> I know it's like, you, not only can you not dream, you really can't plan. I mean, it's just at some point you look at the numbers, you go, it's not going to work. God's going to have to do something or scholarships or, yeah. you know, the way colleges operate, something's going to have to change because this is just not sustainable in any way, oh. shape or form. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling mine work hard. <laughs> yeah. Right on. I'm uh, yeah. Well, we had a little, little range with our kids. I'm happy to share that with you sometime. I'm not sure that it worked, but it was at least an attempt at a plan. Yeah, I look forward to hearing that. Well, let's jump into this conversation around the blessed rhythms, which is really what we're getting into today with these missionary rhythms. Um, and and the, it's the acrostic of bless. I'll, just real quick, I just want to say thank you guys for pioneering in this. So it's probably, oh man, almost 10 years ago now, I think I was living in Auburn, Alabama. And okay. we this was like our first experience with microchurch. And we had a group of people that we were uh, discipling, living in, in family with and, and dreaming about what it would look like in our city to see more of these little extended spiritual families emerge. And I stumbled across this little three minute video that your brother Dave did. No kidding. It just absolutely, you know, blew my mind with the blessed rhythms and this idea of uh, the, the story of the converters versus the blessers. Yeah, right. And the transformation that happened. I remember, I don't know how many times I showed that video to people, uh, but it just radically changed the way that we thought about what does it look like to live in a neighborhood or in a workplace with these blessed rhythms. So this acrostic of bless. So what I'm, I'm going to turn it back to you. I, I'm just excited about it, but I'm just sort of teasing it here. So why don't you give us the origin of bless within uh, community Christian? Yeah, you know, you mentioned Auburn. Uh, were you part of the university there? Or? I didn't go to school there. We helped start uh, the college ministry in our church uh, there. Okay. We should talk on that sometime because I've got uh, <laughs> our, our current worship pastors uh, graduated from Auburn, lived down uh, there. And what? I've got another couple in my small group right now that are Auburn grads. So there's an interesting yeah. Chicago connection with Auburn. We, we were diehard Alabama Crimson Tide fans. <laughs> oh, my goodness. How did you live down there? <laughs> but Jesus called us to Auburn. So. <laughs> Right. It's man, a beautiful oh place. Beautiful place. Talk about like doing mission work in enemy territory, buddy. You're, yeah. Well, I, we always joke about this because I wore Bama shirts everywhere and people are always like, you are not a very good missionary to this place. Yeah, right. <laughs> Too funny. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, Brian, I think for me, uh, a lot of this begins where, when I grew up. I mean, I, I was fortunate to grow up in a home with parents who were Christ followers. And I mean, they just consistently sort of gave their lives to blessing people mm. and places they came across every day. And, and they still do. They're remarkable people. My, my dad uh, just retired from ministry this past year. He's 80 and um, 63 years in ministry. Uh, the week before his retirement party, he pulled me aside and we were talking. He said, yeah, John, I'm thinking about maybe um, looking for a life coach. I'm trying to figure out what's next. <laughs> so that's beautiful. Yeah, it is. It's pretty cool. I, I mean, I was, I was blessed. I mean, and it wasn't so much what my parents said, you know, as much as it was how they lived their lives. I remember them, you know, praying for people who were far from God, um, sharing meals with folks, uh, just to know them better, having people in our home that didn't have a place to go. I mean, honestly, just blessing the people in places they encountered um, just about every day. And then, of course, as I got older, you know, they began to use their words along with their actions to share me, share with me, you know, how the love of Jesus had impacted their life. And so, you know, when I was about 10 years old, I, I decided I wanted to follow Jesus. And uh, we kind of did it old school in my church. It was a Sunday night service and we'd have an altar call and I walked down the aisle, committed my life to Christ, was baptized right then and there. Awesome. And and so, yeah, and so I was just super fortunate to grow up in that kind of environment. And of course, you know, my teen years, there are plenty of ups and downs, but, you know, somewhere, I think around my senior year of high school, I decided, you know, if I could do anything that I thought would have the greatest impact uh, for the kingdom, it would be to go to full, into full-time ministry. And, uh, and so I did, I sat on that path. My older brother, Dave, uh, also followed that path. We went to the same Christian college together where we would often dream of what it might look like, you know, to start a church. And I think, you know, we were definitely, I mean, I was 23 when we started Community. Dave was 26. Another guy on our team was 21. I mean, we were young, naive. Uh, 
I think, you know, thought we could do church better than anybody else. (laughs) (laughs) And so, I mean, it was just armed with a passion for evangelism and a dream to change the world that we started community with, you know, it was five of us. Uh, And uh, with this mission of, you know, helping people find their way back to God. And um, that's been our mission really from the very beginning. But as you know, I mean, it's one thing to have a mission. It's another thing to live that um, mission out. And, um, you know, the truth is we, we experienced, I think, some of the frustrations that uh, other people experience uh, that we began to see in our people as we tried to help them live out this mission. And, um, you know, I think when people have found their way back to God, they truly hope their friends and family will also yeah, find sure. their way back to God. Um, but we wanted to help people move beyond hoping to actually helping. Yeah. And so that's when we uh, came across that, that uh, blessers versus converters story that you referenced uh that dissertation would you like me to just share that real quick yeah i would love yeah because i barely mentioned it but i'd love for people to hear that again absolutely okay yeah it's a it's a doctoral dissertation and brian you'll be surprised to to, to hear this but i don't typically include dissertations in my casual reading (laughs) (laughs) but when it's titled blessers versus converters it kind of catches your eye you know yeah and so uh, it was a study based on two teams of missionaries who um, both went to Thailand, but they went with two different uh, strategies. The blessers were, uh, they, they went with the intention of simply blessing people. Just, they want to be a blessing. We're here to bless whoever comes our way. That's was sort of what they would say. And, and so they studied these two groups for a couple of years. And here, here's what they discovered. Okay. First, they found the blessers presence in the community did result in tremendous amounts of social good. All right. A better society, greater community life. Uh, The converters, they went with the sole intention of converting people, evangelizing people. But interestingly enough, they didn't see any of those results with the converters. The community life wasn't necessarily better. There wasn't this social good that was experienced. Secondly, though, this was most surprising, all right? The blessers had 50 times as many people find their way back to God, 50 times the number of conversions as the converters. Now, that's, that's stunning, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, so, you know, bottom line, I think what we discovered there, and that's not the only reason, but it was certainly an eye opener that the best way to love your neighbors and change the world, or as we like to say, help people find their way back to God is uh, to be a blesser. So that, that's kind of where that came from. That opened our eyes. But then we started looking at scripture, which, we, <laughs> which is a good thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's grounded. It's grounded. <laughs> Not that we were looking before, but you know, when you start looking at scripture through this lens of blessing, it's just like, whoa, yeah. I mean, it blows you away. Um, you know, as far back as Genesis chapter 12, right? Abraham, God told him, I'll make you into a great nation. I will bless you. Uh, I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Um, all the people on earth will be blessed through you. Uh, you know, I think those first three verses in Genesis 12, the word bless is used five times. Yeah. And so, you know, that's kind of where it all, all began. And then, of course, you know, we looked into the life of Christ and we're just yeah. amazed by how often that came up as well in his life. You know, you look at the Sermon on the Mount, you know, you look at um, the Beatitudes there, nine ways you can live a blessed life. You look at how um, in, in Mark 10, for example, people were bringing children to Jesus so that he could bless them. He held them and he blessed them. I mean, over and over again, we just see this throughout the life of Jesus. He went about blessing the people and places he came across. And so that's where we found these five ways that Jesus went about loving his neighbors or people and changing the world that we felt like we could challenge people to, to live out themselves. And it would be sort of a, a natural, um, not a, you know, yeah. a sort of hard way to, to live out what we all want to live out and be the kind of evangelists that we really want to be without it feeling like a sales pitch, right? Or yeah. turning anybody off, which is the last thing we want to do. Yeah, I think that that's one of the things that we've discovered time and again, as we have equipped people in these rhythms or trained around them, taught around them is like, maybe you've been through some sort of form evangelism in a box type thing, and it feels so forced. Uh, But we would say the blessed rhythms are honestly things you're doing already. You just begin to do them with gospel intentionality. And so, you know, just to jump into that real quick, I'd love to just kind of pick each one of these apart. So we've talked all around and we keep saying bless rhythms. We said blesses and acrostic. Here are the five. One, begin in prayer. 
Mm-hmm. Two, we would say listen or listen and engage. The E would be eat. The first Our, S, everybody's favorite, right? Eat. Everybody's <laughs> favorite. The first S would be serve or make the kingdom uh-huh. tangible in some way. And the last S would be story. So I know these are important to your your family. So I like I, I want to get into uh, let's just explore each one of them. You can even talk about your own story as we break them apart. But let's start with begin in prayer. Yep. What does it mean for you? And maybe a key practice that goes with it. For sure. And, you know, um, Brian, one thing, too, I, I found super interesting. I'll, I'll say this, then I'll go into the, the begin with prayer. And maybe you've seen this. George Barna, not too long ago, led a really interesting study asking our friends and neighbors what they would value in someone with whom they would have spiritual conversations. And it's, it's just like what you said, it's just kind of being natural. It's like, I mean, these blessed practices are like a remedial course on how to be a good friend, right? And he found three qualities. They want someone who will listen without judgment, mm. someone who will allow me to draw my own conclusions. Yeah. And then they want someone who can speak confidently about their own story. And I think that's, that's kind of what we're, we're talking about when we, when we talk about blessed. It's just, you know, being a good friend, right? Yeah. And G- Jesus was known as a friend of sinners, right? So yeah. anyway, so begin with prayer. Um, yeah, again, you know, we looked at the life of Jesus. He went on a mountaintop and he prayed before he did anything else. And we see that over and over again, him retreating to pray. So when we do this, we're following um, his example. And, I, you know, a while back, somebody man, pulled me aside and they said, um, you know, John, there are people around you every day who have never once had someone pray for them. Mm. Not one time. And, you know, as I mentioned, I grew up in a Christ following home. So my folks have been praying for me before I was even born. Right. And still to this day, I know every day do. And when this person said that to me, I thought, well, that's, that's profoundly sad. And I'm not talking about, you know, stopping somebody on the street, putting your hand on their shoulder and another hand up like this and making a scene. <laughs> You know, let's just offer up a prayer on their behalf. Like, God bless that person. I don't know what they got going on today, but would you bless them? Um, or ask God to show you how you can bless them yourself. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, the prayer piece is huge. I mean, for me personally, a um, couple things come to mind. One is um, I have a list of folks that I keep in my journal. Um, I write, I have the word bless on there. And I actually use a... Um, an app on my laptop for my, my journaling. It's just kind of how it works best for me. But at one section of my sort of daily template is B-L-E-S-S and then a list of like about five or six couples. Most of them live right here across the street in my neighborhood. And so when I'm, you know, doing, doing it the way I want to do it, which is most days I'm, I'm saying a prayer and just simply saying, God, look, help me to know ways that I can, you know, bless these, these couples, these people that I know live nearby me that I know, um, you want to see as part of your kingdom. So, so yeah. let me know what that could look like for me to, to bless them. But then I'm also asking in my prayers saying, God, okay, I know there's also probably going to be opportunities throughout the course of my day where I can spontaneously bless somebody. I don't even know it's going to happen, but at some point today, it's going to happen. Yeah. So, uh, you know, help me, help me to look for those opportunities too. So yeah, you know, in some ways, beginning with prayer, it, it's a great way to, uh, ask God to help you know who to bless, but I think it's also a great way to begin to actually bless people. We, we discount it, don't we? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Prayer, you know, we, we've heard the same prayer shouldn't be the last resort. It should be your first intent, but it's really true. And um, I think one of the dangers of many attempts to give practical ways to actually be on mission is that we minimize or discount prayer. Mm-hmm. And man, that's, that's probably the best thing we can bring to the table, man. And anybody can do it anytime. Yeah. And it counts. Like yeah. when you pray for somebody, yeah, you're, you're on mission in that moment for that person. So uh, that's kind of what it looks like uh, when it comes to this whole idea of, you know, begin with prayer. Yeah, we, we, we train around two simple prayers. If you don't get anything else, just every day pray, Jesus, where are you at work? And then listen wait for him to respond. (laughs) And then Jesus, how can I join you? Like those two simple prayers every day. And really it becomes like this breathing thing of we're going to do this all through the day. Jesus, I'm about to enter into this meeting. Where are you at work in this meeting? How can I join you in it? I'm about to walk back into my house at the end of the day and my family's tired. They've gone through a lot, but where are you at work? How can I join you? And it just becomes a new filter through which to see the day. Yeah, I really like that, Brian, because I feel like sometimes we forget that, I mean, we truly are on mission all the time, every moment of every day, and these blessed practices apply to 
any relationship. And you, you know, you, you got to begin with the folks you're in closest proximity to, right? So if you're not living these out, you know, in your home, then you're probably not going to do a really good job of living it out with the people that you work with or the people in your neighborhood. So yeah, I love that. Uh, it's interesting. Sometimes I, I encourage people, they don't know how to pray. I'll say, well, you know, how about the golden rule of prayer? Just pray for others as you would have them pray for you. Oh, that's like, good. There's ways that I, I want people to be praying for me. Okay, well, chances are, if I want that, yeah, then the guy that you know I'm trying to pray for and get to know that I don't know super well yet, he probably would like that too. So I'll just start by praying for him the way I want people to pray for me. Ah, that's fantastic. I love that. So I, what I like about these first two rhythms is they help us slow down. We're yeah. all trained in a mindset to go, go, go. But these first two uh, help us slow down. So begin in prayer helps us to think about others first, train us to listen to the voice of the spirit. So the L is next. So listen, how is that kind of integrated into your life now? Yeah, good, good, good question, Brian. And, you know, I think, you know, just to say it out loud, we have a lot of work to do in this area. Yeah. <laughs> or I have a lot of work to do in this area. And I think uh, it's unfortunate, but you know, Christians are more known for talking than listening. And I think uh, we just underestimate the value and impact of, of listening. Um, you know, asking questions and then listening was absolutely central to Jesus' life and ministry. I read one author who said that Jesus asked 307 questions and answered three of them. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's, that's remarkable, isn't it? I mean, and often, said, often responded to questions with more questions. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Frustrated the heck out of people, right? <laughs> and, and again, I mean, you know, the George Barna survey found that our non-believing friends would be open to talking about spiritual matters with someone with whom they know will listen without yeah. judgment. And man, we just so quickly want to dive in and correct or judge. And, uh, you know, we're, we're big on um, the alpha course at, at community. We love alpha. Yeah. yeah seen just tremendous results. And I think one of the, one of the genius aspects of alpha is that they tell people that lead it, just listen, ask questions. You know, you're not there to correct. You're right. there to give people the opportunity to talk. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, personally, you know, I, I don't know that this one's as tangible sometimes when I think about it as a practice I'm living out as it is more like when I'm interacting with people, just whether they're Christ followers or not, especially those that don't know Christ, just looking for opportunities to listen, because I think laying the foundation of beginning with prayer and then listening really sets the table for the, the, um, uh, those principles that follow, you know, of, of eating together, serving, and then sharing your story. And if we'll actually begin with prayer and listen, I think we'll be really well equipped to know how we can best do those that follow. So just yeah, being a good listener, intentionally looking for opportunities that your listening will provide, I think is some of the most important aspects of this particular practice. Yeah, we always say ask better questions and ask more questions. And that's, you know, the, the there's an art to that. I mean, mm -hmm. the only way to get better at it is just to keep trying it, you know. Yep. And so just, uh, the only thing that is a caution for me with listening, I always encourage people always be thinking about the next question you're going to ask, right? But at the same time, don't miss listening to what they're saying while you're trying to think of the next. Right. Question. Yeah. And, and you did say be thinking about the next question you're going to ask, not the next statement you want to make or the next answer right. you want to provide, which is that's where I tend to go. Like, okay. Yeah. I'm and that is true. We always have that secondary conversation going on in our head when somebody's talking, where we're getting ready to say what we want to say. But boy, if we could just kind of press pause on that and genuinely you know, take a deep breath and, and deeply listen to people. Um, I, I always keep this quote nearby here. Um, David Augsburger um, says, being heard is as close to being loved mm. than the average person. They are almost indistinguishable. Yeah. Being heard is as close to being loved that for the average person, they're almost indistinguishable. But I mean, You've been around people, right, Brian? Where you know you're talking to me, you can just tell like they're look it's like they're looking past your head, right? Yeah. Um, but then on the other hand, you've been around folks who, when you're with them, man, you just feel like they're dialed in and they're they they like really care, yeah. <laughs> you know. And man, I want to, I would love to be known as that kind of person, right? And, yeah. and and what a what a tremendous witness I think that is if we can truly learn. Um, to love people by listening to them and recognize that that's one of the most loving things we can do is to truly be a great listener. Yeah. All right. The next most loving thing that we can do though, is to feed people. 
<laughs> yeah, here we go. Let's go. Eat. Everybody loves this one because we all already do this. Again, most people actually pray. If we go back to those Barna studies, most people are already praying. How are we praying for others? Maybe we've got a lot of work to do on listening, but we're already eating. So walk us through how that's been integrated. Yeah, no, it's good, uh, Brian. And, and, you know, again, to go back to the life of Christ, uh, I love just how often, again, if you, you start to think about this, these practices begin with prayer, listen, eat, and then you start reading scripture through that lens. I mean, Jesus was eating with people all the time, right? Shared meals all the time. He was known as, you know, someone who was eating with uh, tax collectors and sinners, right? Sharing meals. And I think we've all experienced there's just something that happens when you share a meal with someone that moves almost any relationship from acquaintance to friendship faster than almost anything else you can do. Um, it's always, just, sorry to cut you off. Always, that's I know. Just, just that one line right there from acquaintance to friendship. I always tell people as soon as you share ribs with somebody, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, right on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know the depth of the relationship at that point. <laughs> And because that's so messy, you're a little more vulnerable in that moment, right? <laughs> Not always a good food, but but yeah, it's so true. I, I I mean, I can recall, and I think we all have stories of being, you know, invited to share a meal with someone. It could be at their home, it could be at a restaurant, it doesn't really matter. And maybe you kind of knew that person or that couple or that family, and then you share a meal, and all of a sudden it feels like you're you're close friends in ways that you were not prior to that moment. Yeah. I also tell people. I think because oftentimes, you know, when it comes to the invitation of sharing a meal, asking someone, eh, I don't think they really want to, I'm not sure if they'll say yes, they're probably busy, you know, they've got all sorts of excuses that creep up, but I don't know about you, I, I just, I'm blessed when somebody even asks, even if I can't do it, Yeah. it's like, oh, that's cool, they, they wanted to hang, they wanted to yeah. share a meal, right? Yeah. So I think just the asking even uh, to share a meal uh, can be powerful, and I think we've all experienced that. Uh, the other thing I would say is, uh, you know, this is, this is a practice that we don't have to add anything really to our schedule, right? I think we all live busy lives, right? But most of us still probably eat what three times a day, right? Yeah. 21 times a week. And, and you can bless somebody without adding anything to your already busy schedule. Just don't eat by yourself. And yeah. share um, you know, one of the ways we're kind of living this out right now is with, we have about about a dozen to 15, 20 somethings at our place just about every Wednesday night for uh it's it's basically kind of a small group, but we've incorporated a meal into that every week. Yeah. And you know, there's just something about that sharing of the meal. Well, first of all, the, the young, young adults that <laughs> free me, it's like, okay, I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> right. But there is just something about the sharing of the meal that is is amazing. And and it's funny too, you know, my wife and I pretty much take responsibility for that every week and yeah it's kind of costly and, and it's 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 extra work but i mean just the magic whatever god does around that is just really something special and then what's kind of neat too is on occasion one of them will offer to bring the meal oh, and i mean what a, and what a huge blessing then that is to us when somebody actually offers to bring it for a change you know yeah. so yeah sharing a meal and eating together uh is is just a yeah it's a huge way and, and sometimes it's not even a whole meal. I, I remember this was during the pandemic. I was, you know, praying for my neighbors across the street, asking God to help me find ways to bless them. And my wife, I forgot even why she went across the street, had a quick conversation. We didn't know them very well, but through the course of the conversation, she found out that uh, the the um, the guy who lives there, it's a married fam, married couple and, and kids. He works for the, the the Red Cross, and so he'd been heavily engaged in um, helping you know, come alongside different areas of the city that were in need during, during the pandemic, whether it was uh, food scarcity or um, trying to get uh, vaccinated or whatever the case may be. And so I was at a, a bakery like later on that day and uh, well, there's this place we love to get, you know, fresh bread. And so I'm looking at the, the bread that's up there on the, on the racks. And I saw that there was like two of our favorite kind, which oftentimes if you don't show up early enough, you're not going to get any. Yeah. And just this little prompting was like buy buy the extra loaf for yeah. you know the red cross guy across the street you're trying to bless him anyway and here's a good way to do that and you know it was like five six bucks nothing you know no big deal and so i i, I just brought it down and took it home i said hon you know i know you met them and said he worked for the red cross i was thinking we could just bless them by just taking that loaf of bread over there she said oh, that's a great idea 
So, you know, it wasn't a big deal. I just walked over and said, hey, you know, my wife told me to work for the Red Cross. I just want to say thank you for blessing, you know, our city and our community with your work. It means a lot. I was at the bakery, thought about you guys. Just want you to try out this awesome bread. It, you know, it's super tasty. I think you'll really like it and, and left. And it, and it wasn't, a, wasn't anything more than that. Um, but it was just kind of a simple way to, to bless somebody by providing something they could eat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think looking for opportunities like that is is it kind of raises your awareness when you're keeping in mind these blessed yeah. practices. Yeah, and, and again, like you said, it doesn't have to be some huge, you know, five, seven course meal, whatever. It's like, it might be tea. Yeah, right um, on. Yeah, you know, we always encourage people if if you find yourself more on the introverted part of the continuum and you're thinking, I, I love what I'm hearing, but that scares me to death to think about throwing a big party or sharing a big meal with a lot of people. It's like, well, then think about a simpler way. Uh, this doesn't have this is not about comparison or what meal is bigger or how we do this, but what are the ways that I can integrate this into my life? And it might be just going for coffee with two or three people like uh, who are the people to whom Jesus has sent you and how do you contextualize that meal with them? Yep. Yep. So we often say it's in beginning in prayer and listening to people and sharing meals that we find out the best way to serve them. So that's the first S. So let's walk through this one. Yeah, totally true. You know, again, just to ground this back in the life of Jesus. I mean, he said he didn't come to be served, but to what? Serve. Yeah, like to serve. And I think, like you said, he modeled that, you know, if you'll begin with prayer, listen, share meals, uh, then, you know, you'll probably uh, have opportunities to, to serve. And I think uh, you'll know what those opportunities look like. And, you know, to brag on my wife a little bit, she picked up on the fact that the guy across the street works the Red Cross by listening, right? Mm -hmm. And so then that provided the opportunity for us to have a reason to express thanks to them and, and take the loaf of bread over there. Um, but yeah, praying, I think listening and eating uh, also ensures that the serving is about the person being served and, <laughs> yeah. and not the person doing the serving, right? You know, I think right. it's easy to maybe kind of do uh, these things because, you know, it makes us feel good. But we want to make sure that the, the way we're going about serving really is in the best interest of the person being served. Um, you know, a while back, uh, our, our neighbor had surgery on her leg. And so my wife and I went to the store and, you know, put together a simple care package uh, and dropped it off at the door. It was just, you know, it didn't take more than maybe 20 minutes. I mean, Target's like two blocks away and it wasn't anything fancy. We spent maybe, you know, 10 or 12 bucks, but knew that she wasn't able to walk around and would appreciate something like that. So, you know, not a big deal, not hard, not threatening, uh, but loving. Yeah, I think so. Uh, a blessing, I would say so. And, and again, there are a couple that were looking for opportunities to bless. And so when you found out, wow, she's had surgery on her leg, she's going to be sitting around for a long, you know, long couple of weeks. Let's see what uh, is a practical way that we can we can live out these blessed practices and serve them. And so that's what we did. So, yeah, I tell you, begin with prayer, listen, eat, serve. These things are in order, I think, uh, for a reason. And, and it makes a lot of sense that if we will take the time to start from the beginning, that the serving will be a lot more natural and practical and will meet a genuine need. Yeah. And, you know, it's like that we have a tendency to walk through it. And I would agree with you exactly what you just said. I think. And what I started off with, beginning prayer, listen, eat, leads to serving. Uh, and But sometimes I think you'll agree maybe those four can kind of, except for beginning prayer, you should always begin in prayer. There's a reason uh, to begin. Yep. <laughs> but it's like as we begin, Jesus might highlight a way to serve that leads to that meal. Or as we listen to him, we find out how to serve him that leads to that meal. But man, those four together, you know, we say if you do those four long enough, you earn the right to share the story. Completely, yeah. Yep, and and you probably grew up, I don't know, did you grow up uh, going to church as a kid? And Oh, man. So I always tell people, my mama taught Sunday school and then left to go to the hospital to have me. So <laughs> that literally that happened. Light? Oh, my gosh, that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, but I, you know, I don't know what circles you grew, you grew up in, like through junior high and high school. But for us, I mean, it was all about the verbal witness. And, mm -hmm. you know, we had some, you know, some great, stories that came out of that, you know, evangelism explosion was something that I was, I was trained in as a young adult, you know, yeah, there we go, ask the two diagnostic questions, and then you, you walk through that outline, and you, you know, you get to the, you get to the point, you tell them the story, right, and again, not, nothing disparaging about those approaches necessarily, but I, I think um, in a lot of ways, it did sometimes come off as kind of a sales pitch, or, or a little too coercive, and 
you know, I like to say, it's not our job to conjole, convince, or coerce. It's our job to love people the way Jesus loved them and let yeah. the spirit do the convincing and converting, right? Oh, that's right. Um, and so that's why, yeah, like you said, I think the story being last is, is important because by the time you, you know, begin with prayer, listen, eat together, and you've served people in some tangible ways, I think, um, you know, chances are they're going to ask you, okay, at some point, all right, so why, why do you do what you do? Why are you yeah. so kind to me? What, what's all this about? Why do you live the way you live? And um, then you'll have a chance to, to tell your story, uh, tell them the difference that um, Jesus is making in your life and how he's changed your life. And again, go back to that Barna survey. They want somebody who can confidently tell their story, right? And I think when the moment's right, yeah, you got to take advantage of that and be prepared to tell your story. Uh, I would 100% agree. Just a personal story in a neighborhood we lived in a while back. You know, it's like we were intentional with these. Once we discovered these rhythms and just mm -hmm. as a family, we said, all right, let's let's at least live those first four, right? Like, let's go hard with that. What ended up happening is our neighbors began to ask us about Jesus. What is informing your life? Yeah, uh, they felt the freedom to just walk up into our backyard one night. We we're just sitting there, my wife and I are talking, and one neighbor was like, "The quote was, I think God tried to talk to me three times today. Can you yeah. tell me if He did?" Really? <laughs> wow, which is like, that's pretty um, cool. I'm pretty sure that's above my pay grade. <laughs> but yeah, I will that's do awesome. my best to try to help you discern if He was doing that or not. Mm -hmm. But it was because we had lived so intentionally and created a sense of family that there was a freedom to ask that kind of a question. Yeah, that's great. That's so, awesome. Well, let me let me ask one follow up question uh, okay. and we'll, we'll kind of wrap this up. So three C communities. This is uh, sure. community Christians focus uh, of how you express microchurch. You talk yeah. a little bit about the integration of bless and, and how those things are working together. Yeah, I mean, really, uh, I would say that um, for, for quite a while, we've been asking uh, what would it look like to identify, train, and equip, and empower people uh, to not only live out missionally, which is what BLESS is all about. And, you know, you may be, we used to say that, you know, um, missional people plus multiplying churches equals movement. Mm. And so we were, we were doing pretty good on the multiplying churches aspect of it. And you can, you know, you've seen a lot of churches multiply and start. What we found though, was that people in those churches weren't living missionally. And so that's where the blessed practices came in. And I think three C communities, then the micro church really kind of brings that together in a beautiful way. And it, we, we started training people how to live out missionally. And then the expression of church that came out of that, then were these three C communities, micro churches, which are intended to give people really the opportunity to um, start a full expression of church uh, while at the same time kind of keep them connected to a network of other like-minded churches for coaching, training, and, and resourcing. Uh, so that's kind of where, where, it all, where it all began. And it's been kind of fun to, to see God uh, kind of breathe into that and see some really cool things come out of it. And certainly we're huge fans of what's happening in Kansas City and learning a lot from Rob and, and the team there at, at the Underground. Well, John, thank you so much. We so appreciate the work that you guys have done and, and pioneering so many things and, and being willing to learn, explore new forms of the church and just the way that you've contributed to the body here in the West. So just real quick, I'm going to promote your book. Oh, boy. <laughs> for, for all of you out there that are going, what are these blessed rhythms? If you are not familiar with them, I would so encourage you to pick up this book. I read it in one sitting. Um it was just so well done to explore each of these uh, rhythms within that acrostic of bless uh, to get down into very simple practices. So again, it's not just a book about, you know, how we should go about this in a thought world. It's like, this is how you get down into the everyday practices in order to bless people in your network of relationships. And again, you know, just one last thought, and then I'll, I want to ask you to kind of tell us maybe some other places we can connect with you or uh, learn about bless would be like one thing that I love about bless is that it it helps me move away from people as projects hmm. oftentimes those evangelism explosions or things like that it's like how do we get people converted and then they become a target but bless becomes not about targets but about how do I love you so well yeah. So and, yeah, no, that's yeah, great. Yeah. I think that, that reflects the heart of Jesus for sure. So yeah, right on, Brian. Thanks. And thanks for letting people know about the book. If people want to find out more information, bless-book.org, 
would be one, a place, bless dash bless-book.org, uh, communitychristian.org or communitychristian.info would be another place to find out more information about micro churches, 3C communities or uh, bless as well. So thanks for having me on. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. Again, uh, just enjoyed this conversation, getting to know you a little bit more. So for those of you listening uh, now, or if you're following up later, go check out those resources, dig into bless. I think they will be a huge resource for you in equipping everyday people to live like missionaries. And we hope that you'll continue to join us in the next few weeks as we uh, continue to work through this series on Microchurch Next and how we see microchurches returning in this day and this time. Grace and peace.